Okay, so uh, welcome to the second lecture of uh, my lecture series. So yesterday um, I talked a little bit about this classification of band crossings. So we've seen that all these uh, topological semi-metals, um, basically the important physics is, is the physics of these band crossings. And I have discussed how you can classify these topologically stable band crossings um, by use of this um, Dirac matrix Hamiltonian method. And I have focused uh, yesterday mostly on the case um, where these band crossings occur at high symmetry points. So that is to say, for example, at the gamma point. So points in the Breerin zone which are left invariant under time reversal symmetry. And today I want to continue a little bit with that, but now focusing on the case um, where these band crossing points occur not at a particular point in the Breerin zone, but any point, a generic point. And so that means then these uh, non-spatial symmetries will map this point onto another point in the Breerin zone. And we will see that the classification is then slightly different for this case. And I will again discuss this in terms of uh, these Dirac Hamiltonians and um, present a few examples. And then in the second part uh, of today's lecture, I want to move on to the symmetry enforced band crossings, where we have uh, non symorphic symmetries, which put so strong constraints on the band structure that you can make the statement that any material with these symmetries must have a band crossing at a particular high symmetry line or high symmetry plane. Okay, so this is again to explain this difference. So yesterday I talked about this case. So we focused at the band crossing um, at the high symmetry point, for example, the gamma point or the pi pi point. And now I wanna discuss this case where you have um, these band crossings at a more generic point. Um, and here now you have this case that the time reversal symmetry or particle hole symmetry would, would relate these two band crossings with each other. So now to classify this, uh, it's not enough to just simply work in this linear approximation where we write the uh, Dirac Hamiltonian as uh, a sum of k times uh, gamma matrices, but we have to take into account here more seriously um, um, uh, uh, the, the dispersion in the full brilliant zone. So we have to write um, these um, Dirac Hamiltonians in terms of cosine and sine functions. So it turns out that all of these band crossings basically can be described by a Hamiltonian of this type, where you have two terms. So you have a kinetic term here, which is again the sum over some momenta. So I'm gonna consider again um, a general case um, where we work in D dimensions and we have a band crossing of dimension dBC. And this P then is defined as the difference of these two dimensions. So it's called the co-dimension, total dimension, minus the dimension of the band crossing. So we have this sum here, um, this kinetic term. So now we have, have sine functions. So I'm just gonna consider here the lowest harmonic that's sufficient, multiplied by a gamma matrix. And then I have also a momentum dependent mass term, P minus one times sum over some momenta. And this is multiplied by a different gamma matrix gamma zero. So this is now different. So yesterday we only had basically this term. Now we have also a momentum dependent mass term. And um, so if you compute the spectrum, you will see you get here again um, these sum of squares. And uh, you will see that this has um, a, a, a band crossing of dimension um, dBC, dimensional band crossing. Um, which occurs at these momenta. So K um, is equal to zero here um, up to the entry pi, uh, up to the entry P. So here um, by half. The 
yeah, so, so I mean, this is kind of a general expression, right? It not only describes point crossing, but it could also describe line crossings, right? So, so if, if you have point crossings, then basically you would have uh, these bound crossings only here. But if we have line crossings, then we have also these momenta, right? Along these momenta, we would have a, a crossing um, along a line, or maybe also along a surface if you have more momenta here. Okay, and so now we want to use again this method of yesterday um, to classify um, band crossings of this type. So uh, this recipe for this classification works similar as, as yesterday. Um, so again, it consists of uh, essentially three or four steps. So first step is to, we have to choose a certain set of symmetries. So this could be, um, for example, time reversal symmetry or reflection symmetry. And then the next step is to write down, uh, okay, you choose a certain set of symmetries and basically also have to choose these dimensions, right? You also choose um, basically this core dimension or if you wish, you can also choose this, the total dimension and the dimension of the band crossing. And then the next step is you have to write down a Dirac Hamiltonian of this type here. Um, which respects the symmetries. And I have explained yesterday, right, that these symmetries put constraints on the forms of these gamma matrices that you can use here for the kinetic term and for the mass term. So you can only choose certain gamma matrices which um, satisfy then the symmetries. And you have to choose this matrix dimension for this gamma matrix to be <coughs> minimal. So, so the rank of these gamma matrices has to be big enough such that you can implement these symmetries in a non-trivial way, but it should not be bigger than that. <coughs> okay, and then once you have done that, uh, you're gonna search for additional uh, mass matrices. And so here, now, because we have this full momentum dependence, um, uh, we have to consider two different types of mass matrices. Okay, so check for mass matrices. So first of all, you could think about adding here another mass term. So momentum independent mass gamma, right? So we have already one mass term here, but we ask another question, can we add a second mass term gamma? Um, which has to undercommute with all these gamma matrices here, which also has to respect the symmetries. But then we can also add another type of term now. We can only add an extra kinetic term. So we have to check whether there exists an additional momentum dependent kinetic term. So this is because, right, we have now these general expressions where we not only describe point nodes, but we also describe line nodes. So particularly if you have these line nodes, in some cases you can actually add another kinetic term, which then opens up a gap along this line node, except for a few points. So this is important to check the stability of line nodes, um, stability towards uh, phase with just point nodes. Okay, and then um, from this, so you ask this question whether you can add these extra terms. And so if the answer is yes for one of the above two points, then it means this type of band crossing is unstable and we denote this with a zero in this table. And if the answer to the above question um, 
is no for both of the above two points. Then we know we have a topological line crossing, yeah? And uh, this is denoted in this table um, either by a C or by a C2 entry. Okay, and then the final step is you have to check now whether there's multiple um, copies of this span crossing stable or not. So then you have to do point three. So you consider this doubling of this Hamiltonian um, HD and you basically go back um, to this point two where you then study the possibility of having these mass terms for these doubled versions. And this will tell you whether you have just a C2 classification, so whether there is just a single uh, copy of these band crossing stables or where you can have multiple copies that are stable. And uh, okay, so to make this more explicit, we'll discuss uh, two or three examples. And they all have this form here of this Hamiltonian. Um, so basically, the first example, we will study um, our point crossings in two dimensions. So this is basically a caricature version of graphene, but in, uh, uh, on a square lattice. So basically, this is a semi-metal um, or a Dirac metal, if you wish, um, with time reversal symmetry, and also a sublattice symmetry, or you can also view this as a particle hole symmetry. So the spectrum is symmetric around zero. And so the Hamiltonian is now just of this form. So we're going to do this first step now, write down a Hamiltonian of this form, which is time reversal symmetric and particle hole symmetric. So basically, in the table, this corresponds um, to this class VD1 uh, here, where you have this time reversal symmetry which squares to plus one, and a particle hole symmetry which also squares to plus one. So um, yeah, so we um, basically write down our Hamiltonian of this form. So we are in two dimensions here. So d, d is two, and the band crossing is zero dimensional. We want to have this these point nodes, these Dirac nodes. So that means um, P here is two minus zero is, is two, all right? So you can basically now look at this formula here. So basically we have only one term here in the first sum and we can choose this to be sine Kx um, times some um, gamma matrix. So here it turns it's out it's enough to use the Pauli matrices. So we can choose for example here sigma Y and uh, then the second term here, we have this P is equals two. So we have in this bracket, two minus one is one. And then um, here we have two terms now with this cosine. Uh, so we have to use um, here two momenta. So cos Kx minus cos Ky. And now we have to choose another Pauli matrix, for example, sigma x. So basically the spectrum here now uh, is just here the squares of these two terms and the square root of it, so plus minus square root sine kx squared uh, plus this bracket squared. So you see this has indeed two point nodes. Um, so we have to make sure this square is zero, so the point node is along the kx equals zero line, and then uh, ky is either plus or minus pi half, just as in this formula here, and this is shown here in the panel A on this figure. So let us now check uh, whether this uh, Hamiltonian indeed satisfies the symmetries. So we basically apply the symmetry operations as I have, to have explained yesterday, and so for the time reversal operator, 
um, we have just this. It's just the identity matrix times complex conjugation. Um, so basically, this is because here you have this uh, complex factor in sigma y, but you choose by time inverse symmetry, you map kx to minus kx, so you get another minus one here. So, so these two minus signs are canceled. And here, these are even functions, and this is purely real. So this is also symmetric on the time inversal symmetry. So this is indeed there. And then, um, basically, the other symmetry could be this particle hole or the sublattice symmetry. So if we view this as a sublattice symmetry, basically we see immediately this is off diagonal. And if it's off diagonal, it means you have um, this um, commutative, so it anti-commutes with sigma, sigma three, right? So it has definitely this sublattice symmetry. Or it, and it also has this um, particle hole symmetry with the operator. Um, sigma C times complex conjugation, right? So this is somehow redundant. You can choose either these two symmetries or time reversal and this sublattice symmetry because once you have this symmetry and this symmetry, you can combine them and you get automatically a sublattice symmetry or vice versa. If you have a time reversal and the sublattice, you can construct this um, particle hole symmetry. Okay, so we have done step one in this process. We have a, such a Hamiltonian now which satisfies all the symmetries. And now we ask, can we add some mass term? Um, so basically, um, there's one sigma matrix left. So you could add this momentum independent mass term M sigma C. Um, but this um, breaks uh, the particle hole symmetry. It also breaks the sublattice symmetry. Yes? Is there a type of linear energy? Should you just be the square on top of the vector? Oh, yeah, right, right, thanks. Um, yeah, so this, you see, is not allowed by the sublattice symmetry because sigma c doesn't anti commute with sigma c. So this is not allowed. And um, uh, additional kinetic terms, um, you could write, for example, um, sine ky sigma c, and uh, this is uh, forbidden by time reversal symmetry. So it's followed that this is uh, topologically stable. So we have these topologically stable band crossing points which are protected by uh, these two symmetries. And now um, for the doubled version, you basically do this game as I explained yesterday. So we can just take this Hamiltonian here and uh, tensor product it with sigma zero. And uh, okay, so you also have to consider other versions, but basically you will see um, that this um, doubled Hamiltonian um, is also stable. So for this doubled version, there's also no mass term. Um, so therefore the classification of this model is C, which is indicated here in this table also by this, uh, uh, this C. Okay, so where should we look? So P is equals to, uh, we are off high symmetry. So it's here, okay, it's this entry here, yeah? And uh, the stability of this uh, point node um, is protected by the symmetry, but you can also see that this is protected by a uh, quantized invariant. And so here, this invariant is a winding number because you have this, um, Sublattice symmetry, you can write the Hamiltonian in this block of diagonal form. Um, so we, it's composed only of sigma y and sigma x matrices, so basically the Hamiltonian has this form. It's, uh, it's just off diagonal. And uh, the invariant is just basically the winding of this off diagonal element um, as you go once around uh, this point node. So explicitly, uh, this is a formula like this. 
basically um, the logarithmic derivative um, of uh, this um, of the diagonal block. So it's a contour integral as usual. Um, where this q, q hat is uh, just the normalized um, off diagonal entry, right? So it's basically this q um, divided by the norm of q, yeah? So, I mean, this is just, if we see from the definition, it's just basically one minus these cosine terms minus i time, times the sine terms, and then divided by the norm. Okay, so you see this basically defines a phase. And if you now look how does this phase evolve as you go uh, once around uh, these um, crossing points at ky equals uh, plus minus pi half, um, you see that this phase just winds around once. Um, so it gives you a quantized number, um, either plus or minus one. So we can use this as a, as a invariant protecting this point node. Um, so this is for contours which enclose this um, point node just, just, just shown here. But if you choose another contour which does not enclose this, uh, then you will see that this winding is zero. And there is a bulk boundary correspondence here just like uh, in the case of the churn number um, or in the berry phase as we will see later. So whenever this invariant is quantized to plus or minus one, um, you have an edge state. So there's an index here in that tells you that. So this is shown in this graph here. So here we have chosen the contour along the kx direction and um, uh, we parameterize different contours by ky. And so you see when this contour here is in between these two point nodes, it basically amounts to an enclosing of the, of the point node, so you cannot um, uh, deform it away or, or have it vanished. So it really encloses here in this region there's such a point node. And there you have um, the value plus or minus one for this winding number. And uh, correspondingly, if you compute the edge state spectrum shown here, you see you have uh, zero energy mode uh, in precisely in this region, which connects the two point nodes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, you have to, you have to keep going, right? But you can then make a, a somehow inductive proof, and you show whenever you double, there's, a, there's always a way to find a, do not, I mean, it's, it's, it's never possible to find a mass term. Yeah. Uh, right, that's that's the case. Uh, that's how it turns out here. Yeah. So that that's yeah that's without interaction. So so if once you add interactions, there, then you have more subtleties, and you can get the more richer classifications also with, for example, C8 or C16 and so on. Okay. So maybe briefly, second example. Um, yeah, so basically I think you have heard a lot about whale semi-metals already, so maybe I can skip this part and uh, move to straight to the third example, which is a Dirac nodal line semi-metal. <coughs> Uh, 
Yeah, so basically, um, here, this um, is a semi-metal without spin orbit coupling. So it has time reversal symmetry, um, which squares to plus one. So it's basically um, Bloch electrons without spin orbit coupling. And this corresponds to this class A1. And we also want to consider the effects of a reflection symmetry and of an inversion symmetry P. Um, OK, so let's see. So basically, we can start again from this Hamiltonian here, where now um, we set this co-dimension uh, to be 2. So we want to work in three dimensions. A nodal line means we have a band crossing along a 1D line in the Brillouin zone. So the dimension of this band crossing is 1. So 3 minus 1 is 2. So we have to find the Hamiltonian of this form, where p is equals 2. Um, Yeah, so basically we have here this first term. Uh, we just have one momentum here in this sum. Um, so we can choose this, for example, to be this, the momentum in the third direction, Kz. And then we have to multiply with some gamma matrix. So we can choose, for example, sigma 2. And then um, here um, we have uh, this uh, momentum dependent mass term. There's another piling matrix, and you can choose this to be sigma 3. And so basically, here you could write now um, 1 minus cosine kx minus cosine ky. So this will give you a line node along the c direction. But because I want to connect to some materials, I'm going to slightly write this in a different form. I'm going to add here actually a third momentum term, which will then deform this line node into a ring. So because this is the situation that you actually have in materials. So I'm going to write here three momenta, cos kx, cos ky, minus cos kz. Um, so then um, you compute the spectrum. So basically, um, you find that this has indeed uh, line nodes, which are confined uh, to the kz equals 0 plane, because we have here this square sine kz squared. And uh, this is basically here um, an equation that describes a ring if we set Kz to zero. So you have so so the node is basically the both of these terms are zero. So it's Kz equals zero plane, and this basically defines a ring centered around the gamma point. Okay, so we have a nodal ring at E equals zero. And now uh, we have to think about the symmetries. So. First of all, we have this time reversal symmetry. So this is as before. It's just identity times complex conjugation. So you see again here we have uh, this complex Pauli matrix, which will get the minus sign under the symmetry, but we let Kz to minus Kz on the time reversal. So this is uh, symmetric. And here we have these even functions, and sigma 3 is purely real. So this is clearly a symmetry of the Hamiltonian. But you have more symmetries. We have also a reflection symmetry with the operator sigma z. Um, and uh, this is a reflection about the uh, xy plane. So kz goes to minus kz. So basically, um, it's a similarity transformation of this Hamiltonian at minus kz. Uh, uh, which relates it to the Hamiltonian plus Kz. Huh? So you see again, this is indeed a symmetry. Um, OK, maybe I should call this 3 to be consistent. Because here, um, it 
anti-commutes sigma 3, anti-commutes with sigma 2, so you get the minus sign, but you let kz to minus kz, so you have two minus signs, so this is symmetric, and here you have these even functions, and sigma 3 commutes with sigma 3, so again, this is the symmetry of the Hamiltonian. And we also have inversion symmetry, um, also with the operator sigma 3, and with inversion symmetry, we basically change all the momenta here, and you see this is, this is as well as symmetry uh, because this doesn't change the story here. Okay, so we have done the first step in this classification. We have found a Hamiltonian with minimal matrix dimension, which satisfies uh, the chosen symmetries. And now we want to think about mass terms. Um, so obviously, um, there is one uh, Pauli matrix here missing, so we could choose M sigma 1 as a mass term. But this is um, symmetry forbidden um, by reflection because uh, sigma 3 onta commutes with sigma 1. And it's also symmetry forbidden um, uh, by this combined symmetry uh, time reversal and inversion, or it's also forbidden by inversion, right? So there's no um, momentum independent mass term. And um, similarly, you could think about um, a momentum, momentum dependent um, additional kinetic term with sigma x. Uh, and you basically also find that this is, this is forbidden. Um, Okay, so we find this has to be topological. And then we do this game now with the doubling. doubling. So um, doubled Hamiltonians um, Okay, so you have to again, I mean, I don't have time to do this in detail. So you have to again consider different types of doubled Hamiltonians, but basically the one that really matters is the one where you tensor product with sigma zero. And then you think about mass times here. And basically there's one possibility here to add this mass term sigma x tensor product sigma y. Which anti-commutes with this double Hamiltonian um, but this is not allowed um, by reflection symmetry, but it will be allowed by this uh, uh, time reversal inversion symmetry. So, okay, from this it basically follows, you have to again then double again, right? So to show that with reflection, you will get a C classification, and if you have inversion, uh, then you get the C2 classification. And um, uh, the corresponding invariants are here um, a reflection invariant, or you could also write down a berry phase. So it's again an invariant defined in terms of a contour integral which encloses this nodal ring, right? Um, so it's just the usual definition of the Berry phase, but we now evaluate here the Berry connection along a contour, so it's any closed pass, 1D pass in the Brillouin zone. Uh, and you find that uh, this um, is quantized to plus or minus one due to the symmetry. So you can show, if you apply the symmetry operations, you can show that this uh, very phase can, can only be plus, minus, plus or minus one or zero um, uh, due to this symmetry. So it's a good invariant, it's quantized, and it's um, 
evaluates um, uh, to plus one if you, or minus one if you have a contour that encloses here this ring. So, so the very face uh, along such a ring, if you integrate up the very connection, you get plus or minus one. If you have a contour uh, which does not enclose such a ring, then it's zero. And there is a bulk boundary correspondence again, um, which tells you that you must have surface states whenever you have this winding number different from zero. So if you evaluate this, for example, along the C direction, along a pass which goes through this uh, nodal ring here, um, uh, we will see that there has to be surface states on this um, 0, 0, 001 edge, uh, 0, 0, 001 edge surface, and uh, these surface states are in a 2D region here, as shown here. Here's kind of a cut through the surface preliminary and so on, so you have here um, surface state which connects uh, the projected nodal ring. So it's called a drum head surface state because it's like uh, uh, the skin of a drum which uh, kind of encloses this nodal ring. No, no, you just have to, okay, so you have this nodal ring here. And then you, the contour is just something like this, yeah? Oh, it's not the same material, right? It's two different uh, sets of symmetries, right? So I can choose either time reversal plus this reflection symmetry. And then I find for this double Hamiltonian, there's no mass term because this term here uh, doesn't respect this reflection symmetry. But if I choose at the beginning to have time reversal and inversion symmetry, then I have different symmetry conditions. And I find that this mass term here is symmetric on the time reversal and inversion. Oh, okay, so here it's time reversal and reflection, yeah. 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 So time reversal doesn't really change the story here. Yeah. Uh, so if you get rid of the um, reflection symmetry, wouldn't you be able to add the mass term M sigma 1 in the first time so you don't have to double the conversion and look for that mass term? Right, right. So this, okay, if you choose at the beginning to have only time reversal but no reflection, you'll find that this line node is unstable. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. And this framework, how do you distinguish Jira from the bio uh, semi-metal? Because the uh, way I see it is that, for example, uh, graphene is Jira because basically without considering symmetry, you can gap it. Whereas in one node, uh, you don't have any more poly matrix to gap it. So if you look from the Dirac equation, you should gap the Dirac fermion to get two lines. But how do you distinguish them in this framework? Right. So if you have a while crossing, Basically, it's just a two-fold degeneracy at the crossing point. If you have a Dirac crossing, it's a four-fold degeneracy. So usually this arises because you have um, also spin rotation symmetry. But this will be one mechanism how you could get this. And then the symmetries you would start with would be, for example, spin rotation symmetry, time reversal symmetry, and maybe some rotation symmetry. And you can show that this will guarantee you the stability of a four-fold degenerate band crossing. And once you lift some of these symmetries, for example, you can lift um, spin rotation symmetry, then this would deform into a veil point. You can show that you have a, um, I can add a mass term that would deform in, into a main veil point. So the Dirac ring is for the uh, Right, yeah. Okay, so if there are no more questions, then I would move on to the second part of my lecture where I'm gonna discuss now these materials or the case of uh, materials where you have uh, non-symorphic symmetries. <coughs> and these non-symorphic symmetries give rise to this symmetry uh, enforced band crossing. So this is a different type of band crossing, right? So what I've talked about so far are these accidental band crossings. Accidental because they're only perturbatively stable. For example, this null ring, you can uh, shrink it to zero. Here, this null ring, you could shrink it to zero and then it would just disappear. So by a large deformation, this is not stable. But these um, non-symorphic band crossings 
are symmetry required. They are stable uh, to any um, deformation, arbitrary large deformations, as long as the symmetries are preserved, cannot remove these band crossings. Okay, so they have uh, basically three properties, these band crossings. So first of all, they are protected by non-symorphic symmetries. So non-symorphic symmetry is a symmetry which combines a point group symmetry with a fractional translation. So for example, a glide reflection or a screw rotation. Second properties of this band crossing is they have um, or are characterized by a global topological charge. So this is related um, to the winding of the eigenvalues of the bands through the Brillouin zone. So for example, this is shown here. This color indicates um, different values of the symmetry eigenvalue, symmetry eigenvalue of this non-symorphic symmetry. Um, so as you go here through the Brillouin zone, um, you basically see you have to go through it twice to get uh, back um, uh, to a point where you um, uh, get back to the original um, eigenvalue of your band, right? So you have to go up and then down here and then you come, come back here, right? So you have somehow a non-trivial winding of this eigenvalue in the, in the Brillouin zone. So this is, defines, in a sense, a global topological charge which cannot, which cannot be removed by any deformation of the Hamiltonian. And the third property is really this absolute stability. So you have this global stability. So no symmetry preserving deformations can remove this. And this property allows us to um, come up with a strategy uh, to find materials which have these types of band crossings. So a strategy um, to find um, new topological semi-metals. It basically relies on this third property here. And um, it consists of three steps. And I'm going to show you in the following then in terms of a few examples how this is actually done in practice. So using this non-symorphic symmetry, um, how can we find new uh, materials? So first, we have to identify um, um, a non-symorphic symmetry, a non-symorphic space group. Uh, that gives uh, the desired um, symmetry enforced band crossing. Then uh, once we have identified this space group, we can perform a database search. So basically, there are certain databases, for example, this inorganic crystal structure database from the Leibniz Institute in Karlsruhe, which lists all known inorganic materials, and they also give the space groups of these materials. So you can then look for materials that crystallize in this non-symorphic space group. And then the third step you have to do is you have to compute the bands of this material. And you have to check whether this band crossing occurs uh, close to the Fermi energy. Right, so because the symmetry argument only tells you that you must have a band crossing, but it doesn't really tell you at which energy it occurs. So this you have to explicitly check. Once you've done these three steps, uh, you will uh, find a new topological semi-metal, and I'm gonna do this um, maybe tomorrow for a few specific examples. But before I do that, 
I just want to give a simple argument why this non-symorphic symmetry must lead um, to a band crossing. And we can see this in a simple 2 by 2 Hamiltonian. Um, so basically, so here's shown two examples of such non symorphic symmetries. So the first one um, is a um, light reflection where you reflect uh, here this part and then you have to shift by one half um, of the unit cell vector. And this is a screw rotation where you rotate by 80 degrees, 180 degrees, and again you shift by one half um, of your unit cell vector. Um, so this is the general form of these non-symorphic symmetries. Um, mm, so basically we can write this um, as a combination of a point group symmetry which I call G, with a fractional translation T. And uh, common properties of these symmetries, if you take it to some power, it will give you an element um, of the translation group. Right? So if you apply, for example, this glide reflection twice, um, um, you will get a unit translation here along this B axis. Here also, if you apply this twice, uh, you get a, a unit translation. And so for more complicated um, non-symorphic symmetries, this has this form, right? I take this to some power n. Um, so that means I apply this point group n times, and I translate uh, n times. I will always end up with the element of the translation group. So basically it has this form here. So this will be a unit translation and this P um, can be any number uh, between 1 and n minus 1. So this is important then for the screw rotations, as we will see. So in screw rotations, um, you uh, translate sometimes not by 1 half, but you can also uh, translate only by 1 third or 1 sixth and so on. And then uh, you will get this P coming up in this formula. And then here you have this plus minus sign. So this basically comes from the spin part. So plus would be for spinless electrons or basically Bloch electrons without spin orbit coupling. And this minus one comes if you have Bloch electrons with spin orbit coupling. Um, OK, so then um, now for this argument, um, uh, make this argument why you must have a band crossing. Um, basically, you realize um, that there are certain uh, lines or planes in the brillouin zone um, where the Hamiltonian commutes with this non-symorphic operator. And there you can label your bands um, by the eigenvalues of these non-symorphic operators. Um, so what are the eigenvalues now um, of these non-symorphic symmetries? Um, okay, so in invariant lines or planes, um, we can label uh, the block states uh, by the eigenvalues of this non-symorphic operator G. And so basically, what are these eigenvalues? So basically, we can use now this property here. right? So we know um, to some power n, we get this element of the translation group. So this means if you are now in momentum space, for this Bloch states, it's of course useful to work in momentum space. We know that in momentum space, 
this basically translates to a phase factor. Um, e to the minus i pay p okay, times a. Right, so where we have this plus minus here from the spin part, and we have this phase factor, which takes into account here this translation here uh, along a certain direction, um, which is here encoded in this vector a. Yes? Five minutes, yes. Okay, so then um, we have this expression now. So basically that means the eigenvalues now are just the nth square root of this expression. So um, if we apply this g vector now on some uh, block state psi mk, uh, we get here uh, the eigenvalues, which is just given here by the n square root. So basically we have here um, one factor coming from uh, this expression here. So e to the i 2 pi n over n. And then we have another factor here coming from this uh, translation here, e to the minus i p k a over n. So just take the n square root, so we have to divide by n here. So this will be the case for spin zero. Right, so this factor here will always give you a plus one. And then for spin one half, we have another term here, uh, namely uh, the n square root of a minus one, which is uh, e to the i pi 2m plus one divided by n. So this should be an n here, divided by n. And then we have the same phase factor as before. Huh? So this will be for spin one half. For spin one half or for, for, for the case where we have spin over coupling. So this is somehow the basic equation that we need to derive these non-zymorphic band crossings. Um, and uh, the key insight here is that you have these k-dependent phase factors. So you can have a situation um, where uh, the eigenvalues get interchanged as you go from one side of the brilliant zone to the other side of the brilliant zone. So this is exemplified in this picture here. So basically, um, uh, if you uh, are at k equals zero, so one side of the brilliant zone, uh, then this factor here gives you a one. And um, if you move to the other side, where uh, k is equals two pi, um, you might pick up here an additional minus sign to this factor, and this would lead to an interchange um, of the eigenspaces of G, and uh, this is basically the reason why you must have a band crossing. But I will explain this in more detail maybe um, tomorrow. Yes. <laughs>